Hey, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to our brand new episode of the Service Design Show. Do you have people around you who still find it hard to understand the benefits of service design? Well, you're not alone. Too many, service design is still fluffy and they find it hard to see how it creates business value. I know a lot of service design professionals who feel stuck while they want to work on the meaningful and fulfilling challenges where they can make a true difference. They tend to be working on the small and incremental stuff. Many at the end of the day feel frustrated and some even lose hope. Wouldn't it be great if you had a clear and compelling message that would help you to articulate the benefits of service design? A message that would help you to show the value of your work to the people around you, especially to non-designers? Because let's be honest, when you're able to clearly communicate the benefits of your work, everything becomes easier and your work becomes more fun. And as a byproduct, people will actually start to appreciate you more and respect you as a professional. But clearly communicating the benefits of service design, unfortunately, isn't a topic that's addressed in service design books. So I decided to set up a program for professionals who want to grow and develop this skill. The program is called Selling Service Design with Confidence. And as far as I know, it's the only program out there that specifically focuses on this topic. We have just finished the first cohort of 2022 and I have invited six great participants of this cohort to share the learnings with you today. You'll hear about the challenges they were facing when trying to communicate the benefits of service design and what they are doing differently today to overcome these challenges, but most importantly, which positive impact this has had on their careers. If you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll walk away with some very practical tips that will help you to simply communicate the benefits of your work to your CEO, manager, or client. And this episode is also going to help you see what you need to focus on in your messaging and what is just noise that confuses people. We try to give as much value as we can in this episode, but of course we can only scratch the surface. So if you're interested to dig deeper into this topic and become a more mature professional, I'm happy to announce that the next cohort is just around the corner. The deadline to apply for this upcoming cohort is April 30th, 2022. Let me repeat that one more time. The deadline to apply to the Selling Service Design with Confidence program is April 30th, 2022. And depending on when you're listening to this episode, you might also benefit from the early bird discount that we've got going on. So head over to servicedesignshow.com slash selling to learn more and see the instructions on how you can apply. So that's servicedesignshow.com slash selling. And you'll also find the link in the show notes of this episode. Mind you that we have a limited number of seats available in the cohort. So if you want to increase your chance of getting in, make sure you send in your application as soon as possible. I know that in our busy schedules, it can be hard to find the time and most of all, permit yourself to invest in your professional growth. But if you want to become a more mature professional and get to work on more fulfilling challenges, I can only encourage you to take this opportunity and apply for the program. But don't just take my word for it. Let's hear the stories of the people who did. Let the show begin. Welcome to the show, everybody. Hi, Mark. Hi, Hi Mark. Hey, Hi, Mark. hello. Yes, th this time it worked. Everybody said hello. That's usually the hardest part of the entire episode. Uh, happy that you're here. We're going to dive into uh, some tips, tricks, advices, reflections on how to communicate the benefits of service design, how to get stakeholders on board, how to get green light to actually do some awesome stuff. You've just finished a very intense six weeks uh, and I'm happy that you're still here. Um, I have a bunch of questions for you and uh, I hope that you'll have some answers for me. We're going to do this one by one. So um, we'll get uh, six different perspectives, six different stories today. And um, yeah, I'm going to start with the first uh, participant, and that is uh, somebody who's also in the Netherlands, very nearby. Um, Hi. Um, Hi. Hello. Hi. Hey, let me switch uh, to uh, a bigger uh, image that we have here. Perfect. Um, 
Malus, for the people uh, who are curious uh, what you do these days, could you give a brief introduction? Well, I'm a service designer at the municipality of Amsterdam, and uh, I'm part of the team, uh, the user experience lab. It's not a physical lab. We are uh, a team of people together with UX designers, data analysts, service designers, user researchers. That's yeah. Cool. And what was your previous background? Have you always been in service design? Uh, no, um, I graduated uh, in Delft as uh, an industrial designer, integrated product design. I went to Philips, my first job, and started as a packaging designer. And then I transformed uh, slightly more into research um, and in service design. Cool. Um, so uh, we've just finished, completed a six weeks program on how to communicate the benefits of service design, how to sell service design with confidence. Now, um, one of my first questions is, what is a typical challenge that you've been running into with regards to quote unquote selling service design? Well, like uh, people as uh, POs or project leads, well, they don't understand well why they need service design in the project, what the value is, what we deliver and when to involve us. And if they contact us um, or my colleague, they ask for a customer journey map or user research straight away. And when asking around, you notice that they actually don't know well what we do. And it's quite hard to sell service design. Yeah. So um, people have a hard time, stakeholders have a hard time understanding what value you bring. Like what was the consequence for you? What did you experience as a yeah as a consequence of this well you're involved too late in the process so they passed the analysis phase of the double diamond and um actually the solution is already there uh yeah famous uh thing to happen yeah and as service designers we want to be involved early so that we can help steer a project in the right direction i guess right yeah yeah that's true mm. <clears throat> okay um now i'm curious there was a lot to uh, sort of digest inside the program, but if you had to pick one thing, what would you say is your biggest takeaway or learning? Um, my biggest takeaway is that actually focus on the goals when explaining to people and or problems they have instead of processes and methods. Yeah, you just need to figure out what colleagues want to achieve and what are their interests. Um, because then you're not surprised um, by what they do. Um, and you have more control of the situation if you do. If so understanding sort of the needs of your fellow co-workers, yeah. how, is that, how is that different maybe than you used to do before or were you already doing this before? Well, um, maybe I, I used, for example, uh, uh um yeah um, i can explain an example i use the map um with the four mountains which is a tool you get in the in the um, course and i use it to share my goal what i want to how i will see myself in about one year and i went to uh, some colleagues who work on the same or i know they have the same motivation to reach that goal and ask them hey these are my challenges but where what are your challenges and that made a discussion happen. And um, then it's nice because then you can look and uh, try um, if you can be part of their challenge as well. So you, you, you are basically doing research, sort of user research using design tools to better understand what the needs are of your coworkers. And if you understand the needs of your coworkers better, then it's much easier for you to sort of understand how how and where you can add value in their yes in their work and that make it also less scary because then you don't have the feeling that you need to um fight every time to get a place on the table but to see it as a, more like a game um yeah uh, a game how so yeah a game, game? Or, or a study like you say a user research by uh keeping a diary by talking with a similar uh, designers will have the same problems. Um, um, yeah, make a stakeholder map together. Uh, you can, yeah, you can um, work on on your own projects. Yeah. Mm. 
Hmm. And sometimes, yeah, and it... sometimes you have to put your ego aside for that because it's not always nice to work with some colleagues. <laughs> but yeah, it's for the organization then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of, we talked about this on the show quite a lot. That yeah. the the people around you are sort of your design material that you have to work with and know how to sort of um, use. And this, yeah, focusing on their needs helps you to do better work. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm curious if you could give one tip for somebody who's listening right now and is in a similar situation. Like for you, it worked to better understand the coworkers you work with. But which tip would you give to somebody listening right now? Well, um, of course, do the course. That's first, um, because I enjoyed it very much. I especially enjoyed working in teams with, uh, with the people from all around the world. So it's not only a Dutch program as you're a Dutch host, but it's an international program, which is very nice. And um, yeah, that's the one thing. And I also, what I re really liked is that I called a former client and asked him, what is the biggest problem I solve? And you got lots of compliments, which you can use for testimonial, testimonials, but as well, um, uh, it's also nice to talk with failures because on the letter you can, can get into action mode again. And failures are good discussion starters and great learning opportunities if you have time to reflect on them. Yeah. 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 That, that's a really good tip. And it's super easy, but some there is like a very high barrier to actually do it. But call a former client, and even a client can be an internal client, but the yeah. conversations you get from that are super, super useful. Yeah. And it's a, it's a big step to do it. Um, I still have one on my agenda, but I did one. And it was actually very nice. Yeah. What convinced you to actually do, uh, to make the call? Um, first, try a client which you know you're on a good level with. So it's less scary. Uh, scared. And um, yeah, that's Yeah, amazing. work your way uh, from there to, to the clients who you have a harder relationship with or less successful projects. Yes. Awesome. Uh, that's a good tip. And I can absolutely second that. Thanks, uh, Malus, for this and for sharing. And uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. And I'm going to move on to the next participant, which is coincidentally also in the Netherlands. Um, Hanna, welcome to the show. Hi, Mark. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, Hanna. So uh, also the question for you, um, what do you do these days? Or what are you going to do these days? That's maybe a better question. Uh, yeah. So. I'm not uh, your typical design uh, service designer. Uh, I'm uh, a customer success manager at a small company, uh, an ad tech uh, company in the Netherlands, going from uh, startup to scale up. Uh, and in this journey, especially the last, or actually already for years, I'm doing a lot of the user research in our company, but for the last year, it's more focused on real customer centric thinking and, um, yeah, doing user research with the end in mind to have a clear customer journey in mind and how to prioritize new product uh, development based on those insights. So, so that's why um, I am a bit of a, a service designer at the side. That's, that's more how I, uh, I pick how I picture it at the moment. So this is really interesting because this program is called Selling Service Design with Confidence and you still signed up. What what made you sign up for the program? Yeah, well, I think because I had the feeling it's this is really important uh, for a company to become successful, to be more customer focused and uh, more uh, aware of, uh, yeah, of, of the value that it can bring when your service is properly designed to put it like that and um yeah maybe because because that's probably also a question that you would want to ask me about a typical challenge and yes in, and uh a typical challenge for me is really um because i work in a b2b company so we have uh our customers are not the end users um and what I really ran into the last year is that uh, 
although the company is pretending or saying that they are really customer centric and really think it's important to understand the real user needs, prioritizing development based on those needs. And we do a lot of user research, a lot of focus groups, a lot of testing. But in the end, always prior priorities are always based on sudden uh, things that come in from like the B2B customers. So the ones, uh, not their end users, but our customers. So always priorities are based on commercial um, or commercially driven. And yeah, trying to get um, more in, in, in uh, trying to get priorities shifted more to the real end user needs, that was something I thought maybe this course can help me get more in that position. So yeah. Yeah, and this is a challenge I think a lot of services are professionals face if they are not directly inter interacting with end users, that there is always like um, the other business uh, involved and the other business is paying for your salaries if you're doing a project. So uh, it's, yeah, you sort of almost have to educate them what their uh, users and customers want, correct? Exactly, yeah. But and and they're not always willing to hear a thing but actually to i think it's even more own leadership in a company which is of course uh, definitely in a startup that is needing to scale and needing to that then it's and you can't blame them of course but priorities are always about if a customer uh says he wants this then we'll just create that because the customer says it although it's not based on real end user needs or real uh proper research it's just because they like it or they think it's good uh and so it's also the leadership in your own company yeah in the end feeling stronger um for those uh, arguments than than in in-house people product people user research people that that have another opinion so well, yeah, leadership is an important thing and it's um, sometimes it's hard to influence. Sometimes you can influence that. Um, I'm really curious if that's also related to the thing you took away from the program. Like if you had to pick one thing, what was the thing that was yeah. most valuable for you? Well, it, what, what I thought was really nice the idea to start a movement in in it, it was a, one lesson was more about starting a movement so also in a in a small company i i i could really have the idea that if you start a movement with a couple of people around you starting small in 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 a safe environment to to test small activities around with maybe focus groups or experiments or whatever just to show them the value of what we can reach and then try to get more in between of the decision makers in the company get more in uh, for example the product manager getting um yeah getting more uh, of a feeling how important this is um so yeah th those things were really important for me that i thought that's what you should do in a small company start small yeah. not yeah <clears throat> And also in a big company, I think, uh, again, we uh, quite recently had a few episodes where uh, the power of communities, the power of movement was discussed. And it's really hard to change something by yourself entirely. So the, if you can find more people who share the same beliefs, who share the same attitude, who share the same mindset, um, you increase the likelihood that this will actually change something bigger inside the company. So starting a movement is, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. That's what you really need if you want to be climbing up the ladder in decision making in a company. To, yeah, yeah, I think that makes some impact. Yeah. Is that uh, so? That's the thing you took away. Is that also the tip you would give people listening right now, or did you have a different piece of advice? Yeah, yeah, I think it's very related to that, and and. Um, yeah, not make it too. So I, I had the feeling I always made it very big in my mind that it's something we we knew we need to put service design on the company map for and and uh, make yeah and then not not achieving that properly and not like the things that I 
shown in all the customer uh, or all the um, research and in uh, on our customer journey map that that I wasn't wasn't able to get those priorities really into real product development uh, really showed me that I should start looking at it smaller and start with smaller activities smart small and then try to explain to other colleagues why it's so important and get their attitude also more to this way of thinking instead of only doing what's commercially probably uh, because for me in the end um uh, these these b2b customers won't stay if your end users are not not satisfied right and and i think that people are still a bit blind of oh the, the end these b2b customers they are the one paying but in the end, if in the year ahead, they, their end users are not happy, they won't stay as a customer. So investing in those end users, making them make the service better, that's what we need to, to, to show. And it can also be done in, in smaller projects. So, yeah, mm. that would be a tip. Yeah, <clears throat> it's really hard to sort of um, explain sometimes the ideas and the concepts of service design. It's much better to show them. And if you can show them on a small scale, sure, why not? Why not right? If that helps you to actually set a step um, in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that would be my tip. Anna, yeah. yeah, cool. Great tip. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I'm going to move over to our next participant. We're going to move away from the Netherlands and uh, fly all the way to uh, India today. Hey, Poova. Hello, hi Mark. Hey, uh, good chatting with you. And of course, I have the same question for you as well. Um, who are you and what sure. do you do these days? Yeah, sure. So hi everyone, um, I'm Purva. I'm part of a company called ThoughtWorks. I'm working here as a service designer, which is not an in-house service design uh, role, but more like on a consultancy or consulting side. It's an IT tech consulting company. So we have to work with multiple clients um, and um, yeah, try to solve crazy problems. So. Try to solve crazy problems. That sounds like uh, the average yeah. <laughs> average day of a service design professional. Um, so you're at an agency or a consultancy, um, you're working with clients. What are some of the typical challenges that you encounter? I I think what Malus also said, um, oftentimes we have we are parachuted into a situation which is already worst and we are expected to suddenly you know work on the leaking uh, tabs and start bridging the gaps that are there from you know time uh, long enough. So it becomes very challenging and for uh, companies who have never had any interactions with design, any of design disciplines, it becomes hard because they are used to looking at design which, which can deliver tangible outcomes like UX or industrial design and then suddenly service design would want to ask, uh, <laughs> wants to solve, you know, crazy problems like change management or you know, everything uh, that needs to be done to fix the problem. So it becomes hard for us to tell them what exactly we do because it's changing all the time. Yeah, so they have a day, quote unquote, the, the, the clients without a design heritage have a different perspective on the word design. And that brings, I guess, some uh, unlearning you need to do first with these clients to actually be able to do your work, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and in that sense, uh, also uh, the question to you, like there was so much, uh, we went through so much material. What's the thing that you maybe were able to already take away uh, from the program and use in your war own work? Yeah, I have three three to four things to share i think what one of the biggest takeaway is this realization that no matter how great or good you design professional you are you need absolutely different skill set to sell what you do and that is not taught in a design school um, most of the design schools if i can say and it's also not taught it doesn't come with experience so if you have to come, because you might be doing the same great uh, delivery design for many years, this needs more of a business selling and a different kind of mindset. 
So I like the fact that the way program was broken down um, and uh, addressing the objections was fantastic because I used that recently in my work um, last week. Um, wherein, um, uh, you know, there is typical challenges that clients come up with, um, no time, no budget, this is what I faced and we said, okay, what can we just break it down to smaller chunks and can we do partly in-house, can we outsource some of it and then, um, so I, it worked, so I, I really um, recommend uh, everyone to, yeah, I mean, look at it in a very, very different lens. All of the material actually te teaches you something you can apply directly. So yes, that, yeah, yeah. Okay. So handling the objections that's one of my favorite topics as well because it comes up so often. And great to hear that you were already able to maybe mitigate uh, some of the uh, objections or at least have a different conversation uh, around them. You wanted to share uh, another thing, or was this the thing you took away? Oh. No, no, no. I want to share one other thing. This was, I never ever thought of doing that, uh, what you asked us to do, which is calling back your old clients and asking, what is that one thing, one problem you solved? And I want to read, it's, it's, you know, quote unquote, from one of the very senior managing director from my ex-company. What she says is, the most important problem you solved for me was to disrupt the organization's tendency to believe that they know the solution, therefore rush to execute. I was so touched. I never ever thought that, you know, people at that level really look at service design in that form shape and, you know, the, the impact that this discipline is creating. And so, and so yeah, what sell it is just makes us more and more empowered, I feel. Mm -hmm. How so. how did this change your perspective now that you had this conversation uh, with a former client? How did this change your perspective? I think um, it also helped me to overcome imposter syndrome to some extent, because um, unless you go and ask, you always think, oh, this wasn't delivered right. You know, you always remember things that did not go well and you fail to really know the perspective of what was done right. I think this was very, very helpful to uh, overcome that. And I think we can really sell this with more and more confidence because now we know that uh, there are so many other positive sides of the work that we do. Yeah, and it's great when a client sort of confirms in their own words which value you created, because that's the thing that you next time can sort of articulate and highlight, even though you might use a different language. Now you know at least what clients value rather than assuming it. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Um, the other question, uh, of course, I have for you is which piece of advice would you give somebody who's listening right now? Maybe a piece of advice you wish you had um, gotten a year ago or two years ago? A piece of advice is, I think it's important that we look at this discipline from a different lens, also from a, uh, from a selling. I think we can apply the same principles, but it was um, actually very uh, enlightening when we looked at it, especially objections, because uh, you know, what are the challenges, you know, self-failure, client um, failure or, or reasons for it's, it's human centered way of approaching the same problem where we are not able to sell service design. So uh, I think it was really amazing. Even these smaller exercises of analogy and, and service design is like XYZ. It just makes it so easier for clients to understand, but for us to explain, I had never, ever thought of it that way. So I think all of the techniques are uh, real value addition to your uh, already good design skills, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I like how you phrase that. And I definitely agree with that, that it's just another design challenge that needs to be solved. Like, I think there is a lot of misconception around what sales is and how that is approached. And I think that as service design professionals, we have a very good tool set to actually be really good at selling because we are so human and user centered and we can use all those skills, all those communication skills that we have, just yeah. have to reframe what it is and how to approach this problem challenge. Yes, I would agree. Awesome, uh, Purva, thanks for sharing. Happy to hear that you were already able to take some of the things away and had that conversation with a former client. I definitely can recommend uh, everybody to do that. I'm going to move on to our next uh, participant because uh, we have three more stories to go. Now we're going to uh, 
across the ocean, uh, fly to the other side of the world, almost moving uh, to Canada. Hey, Ben. Hey, Mark. Hey, Ben. Uh, short introduction. Where are you uh, in Canada? Because Canada is a huge country. And uh, what do you do these days? Uh, I'm in Montreal and I'm a service designer for a company called Flow, which is a, serv um, a charging network for uh, electric vehicle. And they also manufacture uh, the charging station as well for home and, and public. Sounds like you're a service designer in one of those situations where there is a lot of engineering going on, probably a lot of digital focused people, and then you're a service designer professional. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Like, um, uh, in, uh, I'll speak for my like uh, previous experience. I've been in a lot of contexts where I work in house at product uh, focused company, and um, it, it's it's really awkward sometimes to have this service uh, discussion because uh, one question I get when I come with back with insight is um, okay, but what does it mean for the project, the product? Um, so that's a tough question to answer because often it, it doesn't mean anything directly for the product, but for multiple products or um, they fall out of the bucket because it's like, it's like a, a product company is like a, they have different buckets for each product and they want to kind of classify um, uh, the work needs to be done or the insight or whatever. And like sometimes it's hard to classify, but sometimes they, they, the, the bucket doesn't exist at all. So that's yeah. why I wanted to take uh, that, that course. Yeah, and well, uh, why could you explain? Why, why did you want to take this program? Um, just about the, the idea of um, selling uh, service design internally, because uh, um, like when you get hired uh, as a service designer, like a part of the selling job is, is already done because they had a, a role for that and they appreciate in some way uh, service design. But uh, the selling part, actually just starts there because you have to sell it uh, internally because uh, service design doesn't really work in silo. You need, you need it um, really uh, uh, decentralized across the company. So uh, that's where I'm at in my career, trying to uh, sell uh, service design uh, elsewhere in the company. Yeah, and that's a, I get this remark every now and then, then like people signing up for the program and then saying or getting the comments like um you are already in house why do you still need to sell they hired you so they apparently believe but as a service design professional like we said you need to collaborate all the time you, there's nothing you can do by yourself or so you need other people and then um whether you call it selling or not you're you you have an agenda you need to get people on board you need to get people excited and buy into your ideas, your plans, or at least get involved in the decision making. And that is, mm -hmm. that is, you could, I call that selling. And that's basically what you're describing as well. So even if you're already inside, there is still a lot of work to do. Yeah, I'd say 80% uh, of the work is still to be done. <laughs> um, so what did you take away as uh, one key learning being in house? Um, uh, it's all about communication. Often I have, I, my project starts with a specific uh, sponsor and I have to just communicate, uh, to other internally, to other stakeholder, trying to identify, uh, who, uh, who to reach, uh, out to. Um, so it, it's, uh, I'd say my day to day is mostly about communicating with other and trying to just identify how our initiative impacts their project and try to build some sort of a community around that topic and maybe a, a mega project in which uh, it's like it, it touches a lot of different team yeah so it's a lot about communication i would 100 percent agree and was there anything that you were able already Maybe a tool, a framework, or a method that you were able to use <clears throat> inside your organization to better communicate uh, about the value of what you do. Yeah, um, 
what I liked is the structure, the the step by step structure of like trying to sell service design. Um, so so trying to come up with a definition, uh, um, uh, understanding the 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 sponsor's uh, perspective or what he wants to to reach, uh, and also trying to find a common ground. So I uh, like uh, Purva said. Um, we're not teach that in design school. Like they, they build you a nice uh, toolbox, the toolkit, uh, uh, like a design framework, and like you're you're out on the the job market, and you have to figure out how to uh, uh, navigate in that. And uh, for a couple of years after that, it, it's been um, like trying uh, just to adapt to it, and like having a framework about like a tangible framework I can use like as, as a as a uh, as a gear like uh, what to know uh, I need to know what to do is really helpful because uh, before I was able to do it like informally uh, based on intuition but I feel like I have the tool and uh, I, I have more confidence in uh, what I'm doing when I'm selling uh, service design. And this is also what I've been hearing a lot. Like, it's a lot of uh, service design professionals. The the strategy to sell their work is um, either very improvised or it's by intuition. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But if you have like a plan, a strategy, some tools, a method, something you can rely upon, something that you can test out, improve. Like that's uh, a thing I encourage in the program. Like, here's a tool. Test it out. See if it works for you. If it doesn't, adapt it, change it. And then you slowly but surely start to figure out, okay, this way of communicating about my work works for me. And then at some point you ha you have your toolkit, like you say. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Also, uh, the question to you, which tip or piece of advice would you give to somebody listening and who is maybe in a similar situation? Um, I'd say... Um like just uh, treat any prospective relationship like a service design project. Like we have the tool to build empathy. Uh, we have the, like, uh, we have anything uh, needed in order to, to just uh, understand the perspective of, of the customers and uh, what they want to achieve. And basically that's just that. Like I've been a product designer before and, and a lot of, uh, UX community or a lot of design community, like um, there's some rambling about, oh, the customer doesn't understand what we're doing, but like we need to take, we we need to own own up that and try to figure out a way for him to understand because like um, they they might not care as much as, as we do and we need to just shift the way we sell it. Yeah. And we also need to eat our own dog food. Like we need to understand the people who need to understand the people. Like mm -hmm. if we don't understand them, why they aren't interested or that they believe that they understand the end user. Like we need to understand that dynamic and empathize with these people and help uh, start where they are rather than um, having them force themselves to come to our mindset. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Good. Uh, ben, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing. And I know a lot of people who are listening right now are in a product centric environment, whether it's digital or not, or uh, hardware. I know a lot of service design professionals in those uh, contexts and just getting more and more. So uh, I hope you gave them some encouragement to, uh, yeah, to brush up their communication skills and get better at this. Um, thanks, Ben. And I'm thanks, going man. to move. Uh, to uh, another part of North America, we're going into LA. Hey, Sue. Hi, Mark. Good morning. Well, well good afternoon uh, for you. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on when you're listening uh, to this. Sue, uh, I'm sure that people are also curious about your background. Um, are you a day-to-day -day service designer or is it something else that you do? Um, actually, I, I came to service, learn about service design in, in quite a non-traditional way. Um, 
my background is in healthcare and, and public health. That's where I started my career. Currently, I, I work for an automotive startup, um, and I'm not presently in a service design role. However, I do um, work independently on, uh, you know, freelance contracts. And so that's how I came to service design. And um, what I found is that, you know, like Malus and, and others who've um, said on this call, you know, service design is such a challenging thing to describe, you know, when you are not um, in that practice. Um, however, if you truly looked around, there are so many opportunities to improve services. And when we talk about a world that needs more sustainability, you know, we have so many products. And um, as we look forward into the future, how many more products can we develop? And if we sort of just transition that mindset into something in terms of how might we instead improve services so that we can make you know things just so much more beneficial to um, the world around us. Um, I, I think that's you know where where the opportunity lies and, and that's what brings so much interest to me um, in, in service design. And, and also with that mind um, mindset shift is is in terms of, you know, um, instead of selling, um, I started to think as we were going through this course, because selling, there's there's so much about convincing, you know, um, you're trying to ex win someone over, so to speak, and, and, you know, gain their faith that you are going to achieve, you know, something different than what they presently have. And so the more I, I really thought through this, the more I kept thinking, well, maybe there's a mind shift, um, mindset shift here that we can have. And, and I think Ben might have also alluded to it when he was talking about, you know, now I'm in house, you know, I, but I still have to share with my colleagues, you know, what the benefits are. Um, and I started to think more about telling a story, you know, how might we instead tell stories of what it is that we do? And in telling a story, it, it's very non-confrontational. It's very um, uh, neutral, so to speak. You know, you, you're just explaining to someone um, what you observe and um, how your observations and, and um, changes leads to a, a better outcome or a better future. So from that perspective, um, I, I think that's, uh, really what I've come to start to think about, you know, when we're uh, considering challenges in, in service design and, and, you know, even in my present company, I, when I talk to others about, you know, service design, people often think, oh, you mean servicing a vehicle? And I'm like, well, not exactly. <laughs> yes, the same words, but not exactly. So, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, try to really think about what type of story can I tell here that will, you know, lead others to, to really understand what service design does. Mm. And, and that's great. I love that. Uh, selling is definitely not about convincing. The moment you start convincing, you're, you've already mm -hmm. lost uh, the battle. Well, it's not a battle. You're trying to find <laughs> common ground and you're trying to help somebody and, um, the quest is really how to tell better stories and better, mm -hmm. more engaging, more compelling, uh, easier to comprehend stories. And that's something, mm -hmm. like Ben said, nobody teaches us actually mm -hmm. which stories to tell and how to tell them and how to do it well, right? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, and and um, it really takes just being patient and and practicing and and um, you know the more the more that we we do it the the better we get at it yeah and it's yeah and it's a deliberate thing uh it's not like it suddenly you have the story like yeah. all the work you did throughout this uh six weeks it's like finding those pieces of the puzzle finding those pieces of the your story because it's not the story it's your story and then mm -hmm. slowly but surely yeah putting those pieces of the story together into something that works for you. And again, it's a deliberate act. It doesn't fall out of the sky. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and the other thing too, I think, um, is that the more we talk about, um, 
what it is that we do and the more that we um, engage in storytelling, um, I think it also, in some ways, it helps to um, texturize the story because, you know, meaning, um, texturize meaning, you know, you can't just one day wake up and, and have this amazingly, you know, beginning to end story. But as you begin to tell your story, you know, someone, it might spark an idea in someone and someone might say something. And so that, you know, adds an element that you can then include into your story next time you tell it. And so over time, you craft this more and more refined story and it then becomes, you know, even better. It, it's kind of like um, a comedy, you know, a comedian working on their, their jokes. You know, they, they don't just, you know, come on stage one day and, and tell this amazing joke. You know, they craft it over time. And so I, I find that, you know, it's, it's very similar to that. That's yeah. that's going to be the the title of my next program: explaining service design through jokes. That yeah. that must be that's that mu that's going to be my next program. That can't be. Uh, thank you, thank you already. And this is exactly what happens. Like in a conversation, mm -hmm. you inspire each other. Um, so yep. maybe the the best question I can ask you is: uh, after um, these six weeks, how has your story evolved? How has it changed? Yeah. So you know, I. Because I come to service design in such a non-traditional way, um, I just had so many um, um, feelings about it. And I think meaning feelings, meaning, you know, I, um, I'm not doing it right. I'm not doing it well. Um, but as we've, you know, progressed through these weeks and, and being able to um, hear what others are saying, I realize, you know, what I'm hearing others say is the same exact thing that I'm hearing myself say to myself, you know, the, that chatter in, in my head. Um, so, you know, it's quite natural and, and just to ease into it. Um, but what I, I find so much, so valuable in, in, you know, having this, um, this experience, being able to ask questions, hear questions, hear what other people say, and, and then, you know, be in, in um, conversation with others. Um, and also role play, you know, we, we did all those role play sessions and, and be able to chat through it afterwards. I, I think that's quite valuable because it, it does add to the story. It, it, it adds to, you know, your understanding of the bigger picture of, of where others are also coming from. And, and it becomes a less lonely path. Um, from the perspective of, you know, you're not the only one thinking this or, you know, <laughs> others are also, you know, experiencing this. Um, and, and I think the other thing that I also thought was quite fun is um, just the spontaneity of being able to experience our coaching calls in the way that we did, because each week was so different. Each week was structured um, in a slightly different way. And, and I thought that was, you know, quite, quite fun and, and engaging. Um, and I think one thing that you had mentioned during one of our, our coaching sessions in terms of improv, um, a number of years ago before the pandemic, I, I had also gone, um, into improv doing some of those sessions um, just because I'm more of an introvert by nature. And so I thought, you know, going into improv might, you know, help me get out of my shell a little bit, so to speak. And um, it, it's so true where, you know, the more you improv and, and sort of get outside of your comfort zone, you then can interact and, and do sessions, you know, so much easier with others. So um, I found that, you know, that was quite helpful with some of the coaching calls and just, you know, just be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it can be such a um, heavy topic to discuss, mm -hmm. but uh, what we try to do is to make it lighthearted and to create a safe space to experiment with these things and share doubts uh, uh play around in a in a positive sense because it is serious but you know we shouldn't uh, be too hard on ourselves and and try stuff out and mm -hmm. i definitely can recommend improv to uh everybody it's it's a great great experience um one final question uh sue before i move on to our last participant 
Um, if you had to summarize your learnings into one piece of advice you would share, what would that be? Oh, wow. Um, I think I, I, I mentioned it um, earlier on the call. I, I would say be patient. Um, because there's, there's just this uh, feeling sometimes of wanting to just, you know, either get to the end or get it done or get it right, whatever that, you know, thing is. Um, there, there's this, this want to, to, um, uh, to get to the other side. But I find that, you know, as I go through, as I went through this course and, and also through the learning process is that um, the journey is really where, you know, a lot of the, the great value is. It's not the end point, but just each step of the way. So yeah. be patient. Yeah. Uh, thank you for highlighting that. And uh, the, the, the maybe one of the biggest misconceptions people have with regards to explaining service design or communicating the benefits is that it's a transaction. You say mm -hmm. something and somebody gets it. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way. It takes time. Uh, like you said, it takes patience. Uh, just mm -hmm. look at your own experience, how you uh, developed a belief that this is the thing you are so passionate about. It, it's, it was probably a process of weeks, months, maybe even years. And you cannot expect somebody else to buy into this after you've said one mm -hmm. thing. So yeah, yep. patience, yep. super important. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, Sue. Uh, and uh, I'm going to continue with our final participant. So we've been in the public sector. We've been in a product-oriented organization. We've uh, discussed somebody who's independent. Um, and I probably already forgot something. Uh, but you, Jules, are also in a different context. So could you share what you do these days? Yeah. Um, hey. Uh... Yeah, my name is Jules Maitland, and I am the founder of, uh, I'd say brand new, but we're a whole two years old, uh, uh, a new agency uh, based in uh, New Brunswick, uh, which is in Atlantic Canada. And yeah, we are uh, focused on the social sector, and um, we help them increase their impact through the human centered design of public services and social change. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, there's it. your pitch. Yeah. <laughs> your, yeah. <laughs> oh, so, um, oh, okay. Um, uh, agency owner. I know that experience been there. Uh, mm -hmm. I know how challenging it is, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, but what would you say was your biggest challenge with regards to communicating the benefits of your work? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm a, I'm in, a, you know, a reformed academic turned designer, um, and so I'm certainly not a saleswoman, and I'm learning to be a businesswoman. And and so, in in the past two years, we've we've been looking that all of our work has come through kind of early adopters in the community, you know, who already understood uh, what we do. So kind of selling hasn't been a problem so far, but I'm kind of anticipating a time uh, where it's going to become more of a challenge. Um, you know, for those especially who don't know us or don't already kind of, in quotes, get it. Uh, so, yes, um, and and I th we've hit on most of the kind of challenges and that transactional comment you just made, Mark, it, that's that's the, yeah, I, I, at the first hurdle, I have found myself falling because I will dive into this monologue of the things that I'm most passionate about uh, with respect to design, which is engaging people, you know, who are who are most impacted by these challenges in the design process. And I, it's like, you, I see that, you know, people just, I lose people kind of not even halfway through the, the rabbit. <laughs> I go on, after, so. Yeah, after the first two sentences. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's 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 great that you did this as a preemptive step, uh, as mm -hmm. something uh, that might help you uh, later on to uh, actually communicate uh, the benefits uh, when sort of the early adopters have uh, already adopted your work. Um, mm -hmm. Now you have a different background and a context um, than the other participants. I'm curious, what was the thing that you found the most interesting inside uh, the program? uh yeah i it's i think a lot of it is, has come up in in the conversation already but it actually like the, the there was a, a kind of sigh of relief when i realized this isn't actually about selling 
it's about exploring um it, it's, it's it's very meta it's the it's the design process where we're you know it's meeting people where they are and understanding the challenges they're facing and then figuring out together is this the right approach that was the bit you know it's it's like yeah in in some instances this isn't the right approach and it's okay for that to be the case so I think for me having both the both a new set of language through which to kind of talk um, about the these um, these issues uh, and also activities where I can work together with with potential clients to figure out okay yeah it, it, is this um, worth the investment for you you know uh, so it totally fl- I didn't it wasn't what I expected and, I, and I'm really really happy with with the with the kind of lessons I've, I've learned on the way and, and how I'm going to approach conversa- those conversations when they happen moving forward. So what what were you expecting if this wasn't something that you were expecting? Apparently you did join and sign up. So yeah. what what were you expecting? Well, I don't know. Like, I'm not, it's sales, you know, it's like sales feels like a, like a, a, a no offense. No. <laughs> it's going to be completely offensive when you say it so but sales feels like a bit of a dirty word you know and um i was expecting um like p- more persuasion and that's absolutely not what it's been um not n- not what it's been at all and there was there was lots of oh moments you know from that kind of first conversation you know that that where i started you know my my focus is on that first conversation when i'm speaking to people you know when we don't even necessarily have a relationship and and just very very simple lessons to learn like don't focus on the process focus on the outcome like this this is this is this is why service design can help not not diving into the weeds of how we do our work because that's mm. we, yeah yeah uh, yeah awesome uh i love that you already let it, let it change your perspective and i think maybe with sales it's just like with the word design there's so much heritage and baggage around it that it's sometimes hard to get people excited about this and see it from a different perspective and reframe it to what it potentially can be or what it actually is and uh sort of take yeah take some of that heritage uh away from it and what I also um, uh, appreciate about your comment is like the insight that sometimes there isn't a good fit. Like it, it, it doesn't have to work. Like it also needs to work for you as a service design professional. If there isn't a situation where you feel that you can add value, mm-hmm. well, then step away. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. So, and so having that, you know, we there was, you know, talks you know the 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 tool you know of of kind of you know mapping out the operational objectives and and kpis which is um you know just not that that wasn't necessarily certainly not top of mind it may have been in my vocabulary but it's not top of mind but you know having tools with which we can kind of sit with clients and, and kind of help figure this out together and and yeah and and um and learn together about what each what each person brings to the table you know both kind of uh priorities and strengths and constraints so yeah and and it almost becomes a co-creation process right that's uh, at least that's how i've experienced it and that makes it much more fun for both sides yeah and then and then it's and then it is it's it's like a double you're 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 showing not telling while you're figuring out the way forward you know it's it's uh yeah it's it's smart and it would have probably taken me years and years to learn these lessons so i'm really happy that i've been able to take this course instead of now, now, them. now you yeah now you got them in six weeks and i'm yeah. uh, i'm <laughs> confident that they, this is not the end of the journey this is sort of the beginning and it gives you a head start but mm-hmm. there's still a lot of work to do um mm-hmm, sure. also uh the question that i asked the other participants piece of advice like maybe if you look at yourself and wish uh that you got this piece of advice two years ago what would that be uh well take the course i think everybody (laughs) most people just said that um and uh yeah it's all about applying the same kind of you know human-centered design approach to the conversations that you're having um with with people and and this from where i started and my kind of 
the challenge I was having about losing people in the first conversation is, you know, meet them where they are, like take the effort. It, this is much more of a conversation and, and asking questions while you're explaining so that you can you can give people examples that are, that are most relevant to their context. Um, yeah, it, it's all about that, that mm. how you approach the co it's conversation, not a pitch. Yeah, it's a conversation, not a pitch. I like that. And uh, and the thing that we also talked about in the program is like maybe the best way to actually sell is to ask questions rather than to tell. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, I'm going to switch back to uh, to gallery view. Everybody's back uh, in the picture. Uh, thanks uh, for that, Jules. Um, those were six very different uh stories very different backgrounds very different perspectives um that's what i enjoy about this program uh it's really diverse um uh, you all see that you don't have to have a service design title to benefit uh from this i want to thank you for being part of this conversation thank you for sticking around for the last uh, six weeks i know it was intense um and uh, I'm sure that this will be continued. So everybody, uh, thanks you, thanks you, no, thank you for hopping onto this call and uh, sharing your stories with the community. As you've made it this far, I really hope that you enjoyed the stories and got something useful out of it. Communicating the benefits of service design is really a skill that we should talk about more often in our community. So once again, I'm really thankful that these six courageous professionals were willing to come forward and share their journey with us. If you also feel that you're sometimes stuck and don't seem to be able to communicate the benefits of your work clearly and feel that this is preventing you from working on more meaningful and fulfilling challenges, well, then maybe learning how to sell service design might be the skill that is going to help you to take the next step in your career. As I've shared at the start of this episode, the next cohort is just around the corner. And depending on when you're listening to this, you might also still benefit from the early bird discount. For all the details and instructions on how to apply, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash selling. And as we have a limited number of seats available in the cohort, there is an application process. So head over to servicedesignshow.com slash selling, find all the details there and instructions how to apply. You'll also find the link in the show notes of this episode. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I really want to thank you for being part of this community. Keep making a positive impact and I'll catch you very soon in a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. See you then.